And um, that's, that's what he's, I mean, he wants them to go to Galilee and, and wait for him. He appeared to them twice already. This is the third appearance. So they already seen the resurrected Lord. And I just want to read some of these scriptures to remind us of what he said. Matthew 26, 31 and 32 says, Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And he told him where to go. And that's when, of course, Jesus said, Oh, no, I will not deny you. Even if I die, I will not. And then he said that, and Jesus said, Before. You will, before the the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Mark 14 says, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. So he, he said, After I'm risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17 says, Then the eleven disciples, of course, we know Judith wasn't with them, he hung himself. <clears throat> the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. So they were from Galilee. Most of them were. And they're in that region. Jesus is going to, he wants to, he, he told them that he was going to meet them there. He appeared to them twice already. And maybe there was a kind of a little bit of a distance of, of time that he last appeared before this last time. Or this time in this passage. So we know in this point in time, it seems as if, even though Jesus already appeared to the disciples, it seems as if they were discouraged. And we definitely, you can tell by this text, that Peter was discouraged. Now, even though he saw the Lord already, he seen that he, he rose, he still remembers the fact that he denied the Lord three times. He was embarrassed about that. And I think he wouldn't have been quite as embarrassed if he didn't open up his mouth. His mouth got him into a lot of trouble. In fact, one time Jesus even said, get thee behind me, Satan, to, to Peter because of what he said. If Peter never said, when Jesus had said those words, all ye shall be offended because of me. Peter, you are part of the all, okay? But no. Peter had to say, oh, no. You, you think, are you think, you think, Jesus, that I'm going to do what these guys do? No. Even if I die, I will not forsake you. And then, I don't know if Jesus kind of rolled his eyes or sighed and says, Let me tell you something, Peter. Before the cock crows, I wasn't going to say this, Peter, but because you open your mouth, when I say all, I mean all. So now you're basically saying I'm lying. Well, Jesus does not lie. <laughs> so he said he, had, he, he just had to state it, that before the cock crows three times, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter be like, no way. Well, if Jesus says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it happened. And Peter was embarrassed about that. And he was, I'm sure, a very proud man. In history, says that he was a very big man. I picture him being about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and probably very strong. He was a fisherman. And the fishermen, they were very strong, rugged men. And so Peter is probably very embarrassed. So he's, they're, up in, they're up in the northern area of the land, Galilee. Jerusalem was in the southern area. That's where the temple was. So they're in the northern part by the Sea of Galilee. You'll spend, if you go to Israel, you'll spend some time there. You'll spend a couple days there. In fact, you'll go on the Sea of Galilee in a little boat. They'll take you in a boat. And um, so they're up there in that region on the shore. And Peter is probably just, you know, kicking the rocks, you know, just ashamed of what he did and not sure about what's going on. Maybe Jesus, they haven't seen Jesus in several days at this point. And that's where this takes place. So the first thing I see in this, <clears throat> the points all begin with I. Inconsolable. That's the first point. You have inconsolable, one through three. Instruction, verse four through eight. Impulse, verse seven through eight. Invitation, 
verse 9 through 14. Inquisition, verse 15 through 17. Intuition, verse 18 through 23. And impression, verse 24 through 25. Think we can get through all that by 1130? <laughs> so inconsolable. After these things, it says, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. Different name, same sea. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon, or Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, that means twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other of his disciples. Doesn't name them. That's interesting. John doesn't name them. I think John wants us to put our names there. Me and you. That's us there. <laughs> it's funny. He names all of them. He does, and we know according to Matthew that they're all together. The 11 were together. But just names seven of them and doesn't name two of them. And we know they're, but they're all there. But those are the ones that you know, he wants to he put down. Those are the ones you, you know more about. Anyway, Peter was a very important apostle. In fact, Jesus singled him out. And he said, because his name was Simon, that means shifting sand. That means unstable. Like, you know, the, the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that, that was his name. But Jesus said, he says, you're not going to be Simon anymore. You're going to be Peter. That means rock. That's a solid foundation. A wise man builds his house upon the rock, not on the sand. The church cannot be built upon Simon, shifting sand. It has to be built upon the rock. So you have, of course, Jesus Christ is the bedrock. He's a foundational foundation rock. And Peter is a rock ab above that. So it's built upon the teachings, of course, and the life of Jesus Christ himself. And then now you have, after that, the apostle's doctrine. Now the apostle, to be an apostle, you had to have the teaching straight from Jesus. If you didn't get the teaching straight from Jesus, you were not an apostle where you, had, where you held the office of apostle. I know in some churches today, the, the pastor is sometimes called an apostle or whatever. You know, that word means messenger in that sense, whatever. I, it wouldn't be a term I think would be wise to use, but they're not an apostle with the office of apostle. And sometimes if you call yourself an apostle, you can start think more of yourself than you really are. And then an apostle could write, scripture Apost the apostles are the ones that wrote the scriptures or they authorized it like in the case of um, the book of mark it was peter's gospel but it was written by john mark but peter off is, is the one the authority behind it so you had to have apostles now the last apostle that that was on the face of this earth was john he's the only one that wasn't martyred and john was the last one to go and after he went no s more scripture you don't have no apostles here to authorize it. So to be an apostle, you had to get your teaching straight from Jesus. Now, Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. He wasn't part of this group, but he was an apostle in a different direction. Or he became an apostle from a, the, the different direction of these apostles, where they were with Jesus as he taught in his, from his physical body. But uh, Paul, he got the teachings from Jesus from his resurrected body. But... It was still straight from Jesus. So that's why he's an apostle also. Anyway, sometimes people just, there's all these apostles everywhere. <laughs> no, no, you just got these. And today, honestly, sometimes they will say that they will say things and they will say that the Lord told them to say that. Don't listen to that. If it's contradictory to the Bible, throw it away and run from that church. <laughs> Now, if it's from the Bible, then that's solid. But if they got something that says, you know what, I know you guys read your Bible and stuff, and that's good, but the Lord told me this, this is like fresh from the source, and I got something new. Get up and run. And, and, and bring all your friends with you until we got to get out of here. <laughs> that's heresy. Read the last chapter of Revelation, too. Anyway, going off track again. So here's Peter. He's inconsolable he's not doing well now i know there's differences of opinions but that's the way it seems to me so it says in um verse three 
Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. So I picture it being like this. Here's, here's Peter, and he's saying, he's, he's with his, the disciples. He could have just went fishing. But no, he says, I'm going fishing. And you know what they said, right? Shoots, we'll go. <laughs> it's a pigeon interpretation. Shoots, we'll go. We'll go with you. And so they all went. Now, Peter was a fisherman. He was a fisherman by trade. That's what he did. And one day when he met Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ told him to follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So that fishing trade, he left it so he could follow Jesus and be a fisher of men. And now he's discouraged and he's thinking, I'm going back to fishing. I don't know. I, I, you know what? I denied Christ. He can't use me. I'm discouraged. I'm just, you know what? I'm going to go back to what I'm good at. I'm going fishing. I think he was really thinking, I'm done with this. I'm going back to fishing. And so he said, I'm going to fishing. The problem is, he's a leader. Everyone looked up to Peter. Jesus, he knows that. He knows all things. And so he always zeroed in on Peter. Do you know? There's some people in this church are just natural leaders. <laughs> people will follow you the right way, the wrong way, anyway. <laughs> For real. If you're that type of person, make sure you're leading them the right way. You ever see a little kid, you know that this kid, he's going to be a leader, man. Hopefully he's not a gang leader. Hopefully he's a spiritual leader. <laughs> Do you know who the devil's going to attack the most? those what what did what did jesus say about peter he says peter the devil is desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat he said but i prayed for you you know there are some people that are just natural leaders and they are attacked you got to be strong because there's people going to follow you you have an opportunity to influence multitudes don't blow it. Not everybody is, has that kind, type of personality. And if you don't have, that's fine. God will use anybody to do whatever, and it'll be a, you have a great life serving him. But the leaders, like Peter, it's serious. But he says, I'm going fishing. And what happens? They all go with him, right? We'll go with you, Peter. Okay. He could have just went ahead and went, you know, on the side and just did his own thing. No. He let them all know, I'm going fishing. Wait, you guys that come? Yeah, we'll go. All went fishing. So they're in the boat. And Peter is struggling. I mean, he denied the Lord and it weighed heavy on him. That had to be rectified. You know, when someone does something publicly, it has to be rectified publicly. This is something that had to happen for Peter's sake. For the other apostles' sake. They knew what Peter did. That's what's going to happen in this chapter. So he's inconsolable. He's not doing well. So they went forth in, into a ship, and, in, and that night they caught nothing. They went back to the old ways. Peter, he knows how to fish. He's, he's a, I mean, that's all he did. He knows how to fish. He knows this sea. He knows, you know, fishermen, they just know things. If you ever hung around with a fisherman and they're going out, and then, how come you're going over there? Well, that's where I see the birds, so I know there's, you know, and they just... No, there, there's a sunken ship over there, and a, the fish like to go, they hang by things like that or whatever. They know the currents, you know. They know where the reefs are. I remember when I had a real little boat, which I don't know what happened to that little boat. Well, actually, I, I saw it one time, so it was in someone's yard. I, I wanted to go see, that's my boat. It's just a little <laughs> boat. But whenever we took that boat out, me and my, my kids, or when we were, one time went to Chinaman's Hat and back, man, you in low tide, oh, you in trouble. If you don't know the reefs, and you know, some people, they know how the reefs go, and, oh, we're hitting reefs all over the place. You know, rah, rah, rah. Like this thing, just a little boat, you got to. <laughs> the motor's all beat up. And... Anyway, so they knew how to fish, and they went, and that night they caught not one fish. That's pretty, I mean, he's already feeling kind of down. <laughs> I'm going back to what I'm good at, and he catches nothing. That's the grace of God. 
Jesus didn't want him to be successful in, in, in doing this. That's not. No, there's p- people that are supposed to be fishermen. That's great. Not Peter. He called them to do something different. So he, he, the Lord didn't allow him to be successful in this. He caught nothing. So then in verse 4, we see instruction. So that's inconsolable. You, couldn't con- you could not really help Peter if he was his friend. Only the Lord could help him. He, need to see, he needed to see Jesus. And by the way, whenever we're really down, we usually will go to do something. And if it's not to see Jesus, it's not going to help. I'm feeling so down, I'm going to watch a movie, and then the movie's depressing, you know. <laughs> we need the Lord. Instruction. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus was right with them. They were only about 100 yards away, maybe less than that. And Jesus was right there, and they didn't even recognize him. They didn't even notice him. Because sometimes when we're in our backslidden condition, we cannot even recognize that Jesus is right with us. I mean, he's there. Sometimes we think, where's Jesus when I'm going through this? He's right there. You ever read the one, the footprints one, the footprints in the sand? sand, And he said, yeah, I noticed whenever I was having a hard time, there's only one set of footprints. Why weren't you with me? He goes, no, I was the one carrying you. He's there with us. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He even said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'm with you to the end. So instruction. Sometimes when we are distance, distant from the Lord, we fail to see that he's right there with us. He's there, we just can't recognize him. No matter what we're doing, he's there. He was there. But they, they knew not that it was Jesus. Verse 5, Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? <laughs> you guys got any fish? That's his children, right? They didn't know it was Jesus, but he's saying, Hey, did you guys catch anything? You know, when you're a fisherman, like I'm not a fisherman. I can't, I'm not, I can't even catch the tilapia outside this lake here. <laughs> but if you're a fisherman and you don't catch fish, it's a little embarrassing when someone asks you, hey, what you guys caught? And usually what will a fisherman say? He's going to have some kind of story. Oh, we had one huge fish. You know, we had it was really in a minute. thing got off. Why, we had so many bites. Why, just oh, so close. And fish is jumping out of the water. And then just the hook just got off, you know. They have a story normally. But they didn't even care. They just said, we caught nothing. <laughs> That's the pigeon translation. What you guys didn't catch? Nothing. <laughs> they answered him, no. Verse 6. And he, and he said unto them, this is so funny. <laughs> Cast the net on the right side of the ship. I can imagine them thinking. <laughs> okay, so we're fishing. The nets, are over, the nets are over here, and you're telling us to just throw them on this side? You, it's, it's amazing that they didn't yell back. What, you stupid or what? <laughs> Why that couldn't matter? This side, that side, what? The fishing, what? <laughs> I don't know if. So John recognized that that was Jesus. But he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. I guess they was on the wrong side. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a subtle message in there, possibly. You just got to do the right thing. You know, and you know what? Jesus will tell you what the right thing is. And it may not even be something that seems that significant. Left side, right side. But Jesus, 
through the Holy Spirit of God, will guide you. In fact, Jesus, he, Jesus even said that when the Comforter comes, he will guide you into all truth. There's going to be some things in the Bible that you're going to ask, what does this mean for me? And you got to ask the Holy Spirit because he lives within you and he will guide you to apply that scripture to your life. And it, there might be some things that is, is right for you, but not necessarily for this other person. And it's the same scripture. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you know, Daniel knew that if he didn't pray three times a day, it was a compromise and it was a sin against God. But I don't think there's too many people that have that three times a day prayer that you would say if you stopped that, it would be a sin against God. But see, in Daniel's case, because he was already doing that, and he wasn't going to stop doing that because of the, the command of the king. So it would have been a sin for him to stop. So there's things that apply differently based upon your own personal relationship with the Lord. Like for me, I was wanting to be a firefighter. That's what I was going to do with my life. I wanted to be a carpenter and a firefighter, and then the Lord didn't want me to do that, and I went to Bible college and became a preacher. But it wouldn't have been wrong for someone else to be a firefighter when God didn't call him to be in the ministry. But for me, it would have been wrong. I couldn't do it. I was under conviction. I had to just put that aside what I wanted to do with my life. So he told them to cast the net on the right side and ye shall find. It didn't make sense to them. Why, the, why wouldn't the fish, that's a, not far of a distance. <laughs> Get zero fish on this side, choke fish on this side. Or they're only going to go into the net when you put it on this side. But you just got to do the right thing. That's it. Cast it on the right side. You guys, you guys, you're on the wrong side. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw in for the multitude of the fishes. You see the difference when you do things right? It's zero multitude. Zero as much as you can ever have. <laughs> Emptiness, depression, frustration. <laughs> and you know what? A lot of people, a lot of Christians live on this side. <laughs> That's the Christian life for them. Frustration, just problems, emptiness. Jesus says, just do the right thing. So they were not even able to bring it in. There were so many fish. So then, this is, so that's inconsolable instruction, cast on the right side. Impulse, this is Peter, he's impulsive. This time his impulse was correct. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? John. <laughs> he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Remember, he won the race right to the tomb. Peter says, he ain't winning this next race. They had a competition going. Peter said, I'm going to win this one. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. And you know how Peter felt? He felt humiliated. He felt embarrassed. But when he saw the Lord on the shore, he just jumped in. He didn't even paddle the boat or say, let's get in. He just, he got his, his uh, outer coat off of the boat and he jumped into the water. You got to give it to Peter. When he, when he knew what, what he needed to do, he just did it right, right away. He says, is it, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. It doesn't mean he was butt naked, okay? But this means that he had, they had on like, the, the, like a, um, a certain garment, like an undergarment type that they would wear when they would go fishing. But it says naked because in the Bible, if there's certain parts of your body that are shown, you are considered to be naked from the, your thighs. If your thighs are showing, the Bible says that you are naked. There's other parts of your body, I'm sure. I don't know all the specifics. If you get into the different language, that would, you would be considered to be naked if those parts are revealed. If people want to walk, walk around naked by God's standards, go for it. It's up to you. But that is what naked doesn't mean he was stripped with not any clothes on at all. I mean, they, I don't think they went fishing that way, right? But he got his coat and grabbed it and jumped in. You're thinking, why? And you know, also, they caught a lot of fish. They caught a lot of fish. But you know what Peter did? It was 
Very significant what he does here. He grabs his coat and he leaves the fish. You know what he was saying? I'm done with this. I'm done. I'm not going to even come back to get my coat. I'm done with this. I'm not fishing. I'm not. He left the fish. There was a lot of fish. He wanted credit for that, right? I mean, he caught a lot of fish. He'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, he was fishing, and I just knew him by, you know, I knew the way that the current was and the wind, and, you know, and, and then, you know, and I, I know he said that, but we was going to anyway, and we threw our name. He didn't. He, was, he knew. I'm done with this. And he leaves his net, and he leaves the boat, and he leaves the fish. And what does he do? He jumps in the water. Takes his coat, because he's not even going to come back. So it says, he cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fishes. So they came after. He didn't even wait for them. He just jumped in. He just left it all behind. You know, there was a day where I had to say, you know what? My life dream and ambition, i got to just let that go. There might, it might not even be something that is a sinful activity. There might be just be something that's taking too much of your time. There might be something that God just says, you know what? I know you think it's a gray area. I know you think it's not a big deal, but it's something that's holding you back. You know what? Just leave it be. End that chapter. It's just a waste of time. That's not what the life I want for you. You know, it could be an extracurricular activity, maybe even a, a, a relationship that's not good. Might have to just cut the ties. That's the day when someone just says, you know, delete. Delete contact. Delete contact. It might be the day where someone says, you know what? I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to that place anymore. I'm not going to be a part of that activity anymore. There might be even some, some people that, have to give up some, you know, something, something that you enjoy doing. But Jesus says, you know what? It's holding you back. You're not a fisherman, Peter. <laughs> You're not a fisherman. You're a preacher. Maybe there's some in here God's calling to be missionaries. Like I remember when um, I, I found out that um, Tiffany, Tiffany wanted to be a missionary to Papua New Guinea. She just got her, she just became a nurse. Graduated from college, was going to do a short-term mission to Papua New Guinea. That short term went pretty long. <laughs> and she met someone that was from there, and now that's her life. And I never was around her where I thought that she was living a, a boring life. <laughs> you, you, you hang around Tiffany, you talk to Tiffany. And when I, Roxanne and I took them out one time to have dinner with them. And um, just talking to them about the ministry and the things going on in Papua New Guinea, I tell you what, makes you almost want to just go over there and hang with them for a couple months. You never give up something for the Lord where you ever regret it. But if you don't, you will regret it. So we see the impulse of Peter. He was so excited to see Jesus, he just took his coat and jumped in. I think that's what we need to do. Just jump in. Why? Why don't I just wait for the boat? No, don't wait. You don't know if those guys are going to take too long. So the impulse. Then we see the invitation, verse 9 through 14. As, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Of course, Simon didn't help them with the, bring the, the boat in, right? Because he just jumped in. So now he's, Jesus says, and he might not have known what Jesus wanted with that, but Jesus says, hey, all that fish, bring them, bring them over here. So what does Peter say? I'll get that. And he single, it seems like he single-handedly brings in all this fish in the net. But then again, like I mentioned, he was a big guy, known to be very strong. 
Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Fishing is not a bad thing, but there was a message in that that Peter could not be a fisherman by trade. Peter had to be a fisher of men like he already decided to be. But because of things were going rough and because of the circumstances that, was, that he was going through, he basically in his mind thought, I'm done. Jesus can't use me. I denied him three times. He ain't going to want to use me anymore. And Jesus says, no, Peter, you just got to get right with me. And that's what this chapter is about. That's why John puts it here. Now, John had a competitive relationship with Peter for some reason, but he puts this in there because he loved Peter. He loved Peter. But there's sometimes, he, you know, because they were like maybe two of the more, more prominent disciples, they had this competitive relationship. Because there's always what? Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, James, and John. Maybe, maybe John didn't like always did him the last of the Peter, James, and John. So he's like, well, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. The Last Supper, you know, the one that was leaning on, on Jesus, right? And how many times did he tell us that he was the first one to the tomb? Well, I don't think he was the first one to, to, to Jesus that day. Peter won that race. But John doesn't mention that, though. <laughs> he only mentioned when he was first. You notice that? And he does mention Peter. Oh, yeah, he, he went and tried to hit the guy with the sword, but, you know. The guy was, his back was facing Peter, and he wasn't even armed. Anyway, so they had that little bit of a, and you'll see that all the way to the end of this. It's kind of just a funny thing, because they're human, and they had that competitive uh, relationship. So here they, here they are, they come to the, the shore, and they were trying to get fish all night. Maybe they were hungry. Maybe that's one of the reasons why Peter said, let's go fishing. You know, we got to eat. You know, I mean, no one's going to feed us. No one's going to. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to be waiting for Jesus. But you know what? I mean, you know. And whatever the reason was, he was probably just discouraged or whatever. But here, while they were all night fishing, trying to get fish, Jesus was on the shore cooking fish. And when they come to the shore... All what they were wanting is already there, and it's prepared. The fish is already clean, gutted, and already on the fire cooked to perfection. Probably was fresh, good fish, and bread. He says, wow, how did Jesus do all of that? <laughs> well, I mean, if he fed the 5,000, you know, it, I don't think it was a problem, you know. See, they were searching for this fish all night long, and it was on the shore all along. It reminds me of the prodigal son, where he told his father, remember that story? Bring up a hundred times. He told his father, give me my inheritance. And the Bible says that he, he went off into a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. How many people are wasting their substance with riotous living, thinking they're living it up, but they're just wasting time? Wasting the precious substance with riotous living. And he went because he was in search of prime rib, right? But when he got to the far country, he didn't find prime rib. He found what? Pig slop. It wasn't until he came to his senses, came to himself. And then he returned home. And when he returned home, they killed the fatted calf and they had prime rib. The prime rib was there all along. But him, as we'd say, like one dummy. <laughs> went to a far country like a dummy. My father always used to say that. To us. <laughs> hey, dummy. <laughs> Get your head. Well, I won't finish that expression. <laughs> dummy or lope. I don't know really what lope meant, but it's either dummy or lope. <laughs> Crazy? <laughs> Dizzy. One, at one point, I thought my name was Lope. <laughs> Is that like my middle name too, you know, somewhere?
So there was, so Jesus said, bring of ye the fish which ye've now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes. That meant the fish were, themselves were big. And 150 and three. I mean, it even tells you how many fish. It's so funny when you study this chapter, there's so many people that tell, they're trying to figure out what the 150 is, 153, what it means. It's so funny. I mean, it meant all kind of, there, <laughs> there were so many things. I listed some of them down, but I'm not going to spend too much time. <laughs> it was, I'm like, these guys, it's so crazy what they, th- Here, I just, I just tell you one. Okay. Augustine, he said that because 153 is the sum of the numbers one through 17, this catch of fish points towards the number 17, which he thought to be the number of the commandments, which are 10. Added to the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> I think it just meant there was 153 fish. Because a fisherman, they're going to count every one, right? I mean, a fisherman, he's going to number his catch. He knows how, much, how many he catches. Now, if anything, I thought this one might have some, or two things I thought might be interesting, but don't even, you know, I wouldn't put much weight on it. That at the day, or today, possibly, there's like 190-something countries. And when Jesus comes back, maybe there's going to be 153, 153 at that point. Well, you could see that with some of the wars going on. I mean, Russia might take a bunch with them, you know, and so it's going to get dwindled down the number. So 153, some say, could represent the nations of the world, that there's going to be a great harvest. Or some say the number is 153. They, you can take the Greek language and you can add a numerical value to to you could take the the numbers 150 that though that numerical value and change it to letters and the letters spells it comes up and it says um can say peter or it can say fish and so some say that there was a message in that they took each letter and it come up with some kind of word that meant jesus christ or jesus christ our savior or something they came up with something like that now either whatever it meant there was some significance in the days where the disciple where the christians were being persecuted that they did do this historically it is known that when you came across someone you would casually draw like a half circle in the sand and if that person was a believer they would draw the other half circle starting for the tip and they would so it so it would sh- sh- form like a fish you ever see the fish symbol and that's where that came from and it has something to do with this and i'm not totally sure how accurate all of that is i do know that they did that symbol you know the fish symbol can you put that up yeah oh it cannot okay james is not here today Anyway, but I think mainly it means that there's 153 fish they caught. <laughs> and it says, and for all there were so many, yet was not, was not the net broken. Everything went good when they were fishing, when they were doing it with the Lord's instruction. And I think that's how it is. Whatever we do, we need to do it with the Lord's instruction. Not doing it on our own, in our own power, in, in our own strength, for our own purposes. But we're doing it with the Lord and for the Lord, and it all works out. The nets didn't break, and everything went well. And the fish were big fish, and it was just a great time. They had a great time with the Lord. He already made them fish. They were eating. They were fellowshipping. They were with the Lord. They were warm. They were eating fish. They just caught fish. It was like the greatest thing, greatest experience <laughs> Verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Now, they didn't initially recognize him to be the Lord, but they did now. The invitations in the Gospels, come and see, come and learn, come and rest, come and dine, come and inherit. When Jesus extends an invitation, don't ever refuse it. 
come and see, a come to uh, or a call to salvation, come and learn, a call to discipleship, come and rest, come and dine, come and inherit. It's just a, a call to the abundant life. Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And Matthew's account said that, and some doubted. See, because one of the lies that was told that they kind of conspired together, this lie that Jesus, that they stole the body of Jesus, and then they lied about it. Which if you ever saw that one, uh, um, there's a skit that someone put together about the disciples saying, we got a great plan. And John is like saying, what's the plan? What's the plan? This is the plan. This is the plan, everybody. Okay, listen, listen, listen. We're going to, we're going to go into the tomb. We're going to steal the body of Jesus. And then John's saying, okay, okay, I'm following you. I'm following you. We're going to steal the body of Jesus. And then we're going to lie about it and say that he rose from the dead. And then we're going to all suffer mur- uh, torturous deaths. And they're all cheering, yeah. And John's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm... So, I mean, we're going to, we're going to get riches before that no no we're gonna be hated and persecuted our whole life and then we're gonna die and they all cheer yeah (laughs) and what the whole purpose of the skit they're saying why would they even do that but that is one of the supposed possibilities of those that don't believe in the resurrection say that happened if he did not bodily rise from the dead then the disciples were the craziest but yet most dedicated because even to the point of death, they didn't recount. They did not, they did not, they did not say, and none of them, I mean, come on. You, you know when, when they say, how do you um, keep a secret? Like, in order to keep a secret, you, if, you, if you told one person, you have to kill them or something. I mean, because there's no way. Everyone is going to be saying something, right? But there's nothing like that that's going around. The, the only thing that explains why they were so dedicated to the cause was because it really happened. They saw him, and nobody could tell him any different. I mean, and it wasn't even like a hallucination. They ate with him. And it, I don't think people hallucinate together, right, with a group of, I mean, there are even 500 people that saw him at one time. That would be a mass hallucination. I mean, it worked. they handled him. You know, he made fish for them. That, I mean, I never had a hallucination make me anything to eat. I've seen hallucinations, but it never gave me anything to eat. Never. So we know that the evidence, and do you know that in a court of law, an eyewitness testimony carries the most weight? These are eyewitness testimonies, and people will say, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So to all those that say Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we say in the pidgin translation, you stupid or what? (laughs) Well, you stupid or what? (laughs) So now, so that was the invitation, and now we have the inquisition. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter. Do you remember the last time Peter was hanging around a fire to warm himself? He was with the worldly crowd, right? And what did he do? He denied Jesus. But now he's hanging around Jesus, being warmed at a fire. It wasn't the fire that was a problem. It was who was with who Peter was with. Do you know sometimes one of the most significant significant things about our life is who do we hang with? Who's our friends? In fact, I remember at our college, I think his, one of his messages was, you show me who your friends are, I'll show you who you'll be, either now or in the near future. You show me who your friends are, I'll show you who you are going to be, either already are or going to be in the near future. Who's our friends? So we see Peter, he's in the right place, the right time, he's with Jesus, and now Jesus has to undo the damage of what, happened because of Peter what he said and then he denied he denied Jesus three times so around all the other disciples Jesus gives him an inquisition that's to inquire 
So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Now, remember his name was Peter, that Jesus changed his name to Peter. In fact, Jesus changed his name to Peter even before he was solid because Jesus saw the potential in him. And he told him, and then, of course, when Peter had um, made his profession, when he says, who, Simon Peter, who do you say that I am? Thou art Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he says, he says you're going to be Peter. And upon this rock I build my church, right? Well, today in this passage, he calls him Simon. <laughs> because he was being double-minded again. He goes, man, you went back to being Simon. So he calls him Simon. He says, Simon, son of Jonas. <laughs> Jonah was not known to be that solid either. So he said, hey, Simon, you double-minded guy who's a son of a double-minded guy. <laughs> he didn't call him Peter. He said, we got to get you back to being Peter. Peter means rock. Solid. He said, I need, I need you, Peter, to be solid. You, you cannot be shifting sand. And this is where he goes back to Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest, lovest thou me more than these? I wonder what he was talking about. Is he saying fish? Do you love me more than all these fish, Peter? Or do you love me more than all your friends? Do you love me more than the, the boat? Do you love me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. If you love me, feed my lambs. You know, if you and I love the Lord, we've got to feed his lambs. Teaching anybody discipleship? You know how it is when you have children. If someone takes care of your children, they're nice to your children, then that's, that's your friend. But if someone does something mean to your children, that's your enemy, right? They're going to hurt your children, you're going after them, right? I mean, there's people that, even if they're going to lose the fight, they still... To the death, if someone's going to attack their children. In fact, even like, like, let's say if you're afraid of dogs, and if a dog is attacking your child, you're going to go after the dog, right? So Jesus is saying this. That's how he feels. He says, Peter, if you love me, take care of my people. Feed my lambs. A lot depends upon you, Peter. You went fishing, they went fishing. Feed my lambs. Do you know... When you break this down, now, and I'm not so certain I heard two sides of this, so I want to be careful how I say this, but Jesus was using the word for love, agape. Peter was using the, love, the word love, phileo. I heard different interpretations that, honestly, when you get to the word love, they just sometimes interpreted it different ways, and sometimes it wasn't significant. Sometimes it may have been. I don't know. I know Jesus was using the word agape, and Peter just kept saying phileo. One is an unconditional love of God. The other is a friendly love. So Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? And do you agape me? And Peter's saying, I love you, a friendly. Like, that's all I got. <laughs> you know, I mean, look at how I did. It's the best I got. And then the second time, Jesus uses the same word. It, it, the translation from the Greek. And Peter uses the word, same word he used. The third time, Jesus uses the word phileo. He says, do you phileo me? Like Jesus says, okay, if that's the best you got, Peter, we'll start with that. We'll take what you got and we'll work up. He says, do you love me? And he went through it three times. Now, I think he had to do it three times because Peter denied. He was out of fire when he was been confronted. He denied Jesus Christ being around the wrong crowd, being afraid, or whatever the case was, he denied Jesus Christ three times. And he even cursed and swore. I mean, that is basically saying, 
I call down curses upon me if I'm not telling you the truth. That was like, you know how when you're a kid, you say, you know, if someone's lying, you want to know if they're telling the truth, you say, you know, if, I forget how the thing went, but you lift up your hand, you say, I, you know, I promise in my eye, you know, if I die. And I, I, I forget how the thing went, but there was something you said. If someone said that, they're guaranteed telling the truth. I have a good friend of mine, a good friend of mine. And this friend, in fact, his name is the same as my name, Kevin. Last name is different, though. But this good friend of mine, if I ever wanted to make sure he's telling the truth, all I could just say was, okay, do you promise to God? And he would never lie against that oath. He would, ne- no matter how embarrassing or how bad, he would never. So I knew, and he could do the same back to me. And if it was, if he, if he came to that, and you said that. So Simon is like, he, they that tradition or how they believed, when you went against that, those words, that was, I mean, for you to lie when you just, like, call down curses if you're lying, that was significantly bad. So he was, he, that had to be undone. So now Jesus is telling him, okay, you publicly say in front of all these disciples, do you love me, Simon? And he says, you know I love you, Lord. He said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. That's more than one. That's a, so it says to tend to them. Take care of them. Not only the, they, do they need to eat, but there's other things that they need and you need to take care of. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. This is where Jesus had said the phileo love instead of agape love. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. See, Peter was not going to be able to do the things that Jesus wanted him to do if he loved these other things more than he loved Jesus. And neither will we. If, there's, if, if I loved lifting weights more than Jesus, I wouldn't be able to feed the sheep. I know it's hard to tell that, you know. By my, you probably think, man, you really must love weights, though. No, I just love weight, gaining weight. That's it. <laughs> whether it's a hobby, whether it's even a career, I think that it's easy to know what we love. Someone had said this one time, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. You know, I heard this one thing. I don't want to go on forever, but I kind of am. But. And it was talking about how to make it, how, how come there's a lot of children that are raised nowadays to be feeling entitled. And he says, it's because of the way the parents are raising them. The parents will come to their, like, sporting events or anything that they're doing that is, like, uh, where everyone's watching, and the parents are there with the, you know, with the, um, you know, the banners and the lays and just and t- pictures. And it's such an impressive thing. And the parents are there and supporting them. And that's good. But they said, but then when a child just comes up and says, Mommy, could you color with me? Get away, get away. So when the nominal, normal things, the parents don't have anything hard to do with them other than looking at a phone, then that child thinks the only things that are important is the big things. So now everything got to be that they got to have the big things because that's only thing means anything to the parents, not just the regular, can we play hide and seek? No, 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 get away, I'm busy. And so the child thinks, those things that I care about don't mean anything, only these things where I'm like the superstar like that. So then the the children tend to be more uh, that way. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out. You spell love, T-I-M-E. So all we got to do is find out what we spend the most time doing. That's what we love the most. Okay, get out your phone's screen time. How much screen time we got on there? The thing can tell you, yeah, screen time. And it tells you how much time you sp- I'm not sure how accurate it is, because what if you have it on Pandora? Does that count? I don't know. If you listen to music, I'm not sure. Anyway. But you can see, you know, how much time do I spend watching my phone, watching TV, and how much time do I spend with Jesus? And how are we going to tell Jesus we love him more than these? 
He's not going to believe us. Of course, he knows our heart anyway. The problem we have is what, we, what we're loving. And so he confronts Peter. But remember, we're the disciples there too. We're hearing all of this. They're the, remember the disciples that were unnamed? Could be me, could be you, right? He's asking us, do you love me more than these? Is there something else more that you and I love more than Jesus? What, what is it? We need to get rid of it. Or we need to adjust our time slot. And we need to stop lying to ourselves and anybody else that asks us, are you reading your Bible? I don't have time. <laughs> you can't say that anymore because the phone tracks your time. You spend this, many time, this much time looking at trash. You looked in a trash can for five hours. You just stared at a trash can for five hours. You know the other day? I was doing a charter, and I did the unpardonable. I forgot my phone. Because, the, you know, the company tracks you the phone. The phone tells you where they got to be, checking in, every this, this and that. Everything you do is with a phone, right? If you do Uber, everything is with a phone. It's like they're setting us up to where you, we got tracking devices, every, each and every one of us. But that day, I didn't have my tracking device. So I left without my phone. And first, I was kind of, kind of terrified. I'm like, am I going to be able to find this place I'm taking these people? Because I don't have the greatest sense of direction. I'm like the worst person to be a bus driver. I don't half the time know where I'm going. I don't know why. I just don't have a sense of direction. But, I mean, I know some of the main places. But. So thankfully, they were going to UH, you know, that's easy. <laughs> so I, I had no problem. I knew it's school, UH, so I was good. I was fine with it. But then I thought when I was, I was driving, I didn't have my phone, you know, I felt free. I felt liberated. I almost thought, you know what, I think I'm going to change this whole phone thing, man. I don't think I want to have it with me as much or come home and, you know, have some kind of a different, because this phone is controlling us. You know it is, right? I mean, come on. There's probably very few people in here, other than like Gail, or <laughs> that don't have smartphones, right? The old timers. I think I need to go back to that. But these phones is becoming, it's, it's enslaving us. So I'm driving, right? I'm looking in my, my rearview mirror. This is so weird. We're going up the pulley. And you, we're in a bus. And the bus that I drive is kind of high. It's a, it's a big bus. And we're going. And I'm looking over the, the pulley because we're high up. It is the most spectacular view. It was a nice day. It just, the, the view was just a breathtaking. I mean, if I had my phone, I'd be taking pictures now. <laughs> but it was just spectacular. The clouds, the way the clouds were, the way the sun was shining and everything was just, I was just, oh, look at this. And I looked in my rearview mirror. Not one person was looking out the window. Not one they were all looking on their phones. Not one person in that bus was like, whoa. And we're, you know, you don't often go up the pulley in a bus where you're high up. You can see kind of, it was pretty spectacular. And then no one was even noticing it. If someone just said, whoa, look here. But nobody noticed. They just like this. I thought, man, we're sunk. We don't even know what's happening to our children that are, they're on phones all the time now. I think it was one of the last generations raised without that. Uh, well, our, chil- our children were the last ones raised without phones, I think. But now the new generation. And I'm not saying I know what to do about it. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. And then you don't give them, and then they steal one from somebody else. Now they become a thief. You know, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> now then they're the only kid, well, I'm the only kid, and now they're traumatized because everybody has phones. It's just not an easy solution. I'm not going to pretend that I got the answers. I mean, our kids are raised. Now, you know, we see our grandchildren. And my heart goes out to this next generation of what they're, I mean, here, I, you give a child a phone. They look up, garbage. Hey, garbage. Wow, look at all this garbage. It's so awesome. Look at the garbage. And it's going in. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. You're going to have to figure it out, though. Because some children, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. I tell you, for real, they're not going to make it unless we change something. You might have to figure. You try to. You figure. You try password it. They password you out the password. I mean, they, their their technology is far advanced already. <laughs> so 
So it's like, I don't know what to say. Two, two more points, we're done. Don't want to miss this ending, I tell you. This is intuition. Verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. He's saying this to Peter. When thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. You know, he's telling Peter, when you were young, you just, you, you went and did what you wanted to do. But when you get old, you're going to be, you're going to be killed. You're going to be martyred. You're going to be crucified. This spake he signifying what death he should glorify God. He said, just follow me, Peter. Could it be that when Peter was in prison and they were going to execute him, remember, he was sleeping? And I always thought that, well, he was at peace because he wanted to be with Jesus. He didn't care if he died. I think he knew he wasn't going to die. Because Jesus said, when he's old, he's going to die. And at that time, he was a young man. He knew he wasn't going to die then because Jesus said he's going to die when he's old. But what does, Jesus, what does Peter say? Then Peter, turning about, see it the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at, at, breath at supper. John, he threw in all those details. And said, Lord, which is, which is he that betrayeth thee? <laughs> John, he's writing all this stuff in. Peter, the one that betrayed him and all that. Peter, seeing him, saith, to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? <laughs> See, Jesus just told Peter, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be martyred. And Peter is like looking at John. And John says, yeah. So John, John is saying, Peter was looking at me, you know, the disciple that was leaning on Jesus' breast, the one that Jesus loves. And Peter, the one who denied Jesus, you know, is saying this. <laughs> it's so funny, his wording. But Peter says this. What about him? What's he going to do? He said, okay, I'm going to be crucified, but what about him? I love the response of Jesus. He said, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. What is Jesus saying? Peter, worry about yourself. Don't worry about John, Peter. Peter, you got to stop worrying about John and everybody else. You just follow me. He says, okay. He's trying to make him into Peter again. And that was probably the last thing he says. Okay, Peter, when you're old, you're going to die. You're going to be crucified. Up, you know, and he was crucified upside down, by the way. I'll get into that. But he died a martyr's death. But he says, you're going to die. And he says, oh, okay. Well, what about him? <laughs> Peter. You got to stop worrying about everybody else. And you know what? Sometimes that might be some of our biggest problems. You ask anybody who works in RAM. You ask Brother Jeff. Something happens that we got to discipline or even remove or something. Something happens to somebody. You got to discipline someone in RAM. And you say, okay, this is what you did. This is the discipline. You know, they're going to say, well, what about the other person when he did that? <laughs> what, I'm gonna say. what about <laughs> this? We got to bring this verse up, right? <laughs> Don't worry about nobody else. <laughs> Then verse 23, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. So there was a rumor going around that people were saying that Jesus said John was not going to die. And John said, he goes, no, that wasn't what it was. not what he said. Yet Jesus said, not tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Isn't it funny how he's writing this? It's like he's saying that this is something that I that has been said but i was there jesus didn't say that i'm not gonna die jesus just said if i will that he tarry till i come what is that to thee he said don't worry about him that's all it to wait to wait he said don't worry about don't worry about john peter because that was peter's problem one of his biggest problems i think that could be one of our biggest problems oh well, well, 
Pastor, you know what so and so is doing? <laughs> you know, when, when you're a parent, one of the hardest things is when you have when you have children and you have more than one. They're always tattling on the other one. Like a constant thing, right? Like they'll take something from him, the kid will slap him. Hey, is that me? Well, why you take this? <laughs> Yeah, they won't say all the details either. Yeah. So the last thing is the impression. And this is what John says. This is the disciple which testify of these, of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. You know, that's all of us, you know. We are like a book of what Jesus has done. We're all a testimony of, of what the Lord has done in our life. I don't know what kind of book it is. Maybe it's a mystery novel. You know, maybe it's a comedy Maybe it's a horror, a, a, whore, a book on horrors. But you know what it, it should be? It should be a testimony of a, it should be an, an ins, inspiring novel. It should be a book of inspiration where someone could read and say, you know what? The grace of God is evident in this person's life. So John completes his book. And I wanted to make sure we, Completed it today, and I know it went long, but so again, inconsolable as Peter was inconsolable, he was instructed, they were instructed to cast their nets on the other side, the right side, and an impulse of Peter's, he jumps in, the invitation of Jesus, come and dine, and that pictures to me the victorious Christian life, eating with Jesus, and just taking it all in, fishing, eating fish, fellowshipping, being with the Lord and your friends, the invitation, come and dine. The inquisition. Peter, do you love me more than these? Who do we love? What do we love? Intuition. This is what's going to happen to you, Peter. And by the way, well, I didn't mention, but one day in Rome, when he was old, Peter was taken, and he was going to be crucified, and he requested that they did not crucify him like Jesus. He did not want to be crucified the same way. He didn't... He, he, he felt like he wasn't worthy to be crucified the same way Jesus was. So he asked them if he could be crucified upside down. And Nero, who was the emperor, granted the permission. And they crucified Peter upside down, outside, right outside the, the city of Rome. And he was a martyr for Jesus, just like Jesus said. So we see the, intu the inquisition, the intuition, and then the impression. And that concludes the book of John. Would you?